his uh, uh, lecture. And so for yesterday, and under material selection, you should realize it's multifaceted. You don't just design for strength. You don't just design for um, uh, corrosion resistance. You don't design for formability. Ultimately, you have to do all these things. Um, and some materials are better in some of these things than others. And so it gets to be very application specific of what you're going to, what material you're going to select. Structural materials, or the usage of structural materials is strongly influenced by cost. I've got a, another overhead to show you today. Um, all the stuff I was talking about uh, yesterday ha applies to structural materials. It doesn't apply to what some people call functional materials like silicon or gallium arsenide or uh, lead telluride, um, not necessarily just electronic materials or magnetic materials, okay? You can pay a lot of money for something that has, gives you a particular function. After all, we put platinum and plating catalysts in cars, right? That's a functional material. It has a specific function. It's not there structurally. In fact, you have to give it a, either a ceramic or metal substrate to put the platinum on. It's the functionality of getting rid of the carbon monoxide and burning up the carbon monoxide to CO2. So platinum and plating in an automobile is certainly worth a lot more than $2 a pound. But when I'm talking about this stuff, I'm talking about structural materials. And because structural materials, you know, structural materials are used in large quantities because they are the bulk of the, the weight of any structure, they're going to be strongly influenced by the cost per pound. Steel is unique among structural materials in combinations of cost. It's one of the least cost. The only things that are really cheap are sand, gravel, and concrete as structural materials. Strength, it's really way up there. Um, in terms of strength. In fact, in terms of strength and toughness, I'll show you today, in combination of these two, it's not necessarily at the top, but if you put all three of these together, cost, strength, and toughness, it's way out ahead of everything else. Fabricability, it turns out it's one of the easiest things to fabricate. It's one of the easiest things to repair. Um, for um, It just uh, um, has lots of very strong attributes. Now, to give you an idea, since some of you are interested in automotive materials, uh, what are most automobile radiators made out of today? Aluminum. And if you went back 20 years ago, I realize some of you weren't repairing your own automobiles 20 years ago, um, what were they made out of? Copper. Do you know the reason why? Now, let me ask another question, a trick question. What did the Chevy Corvette have for a radiator in 1980? Aluminum, where everybody else had copper. Well, why do they have aluminum? It's lighter weight than copper, and it's a performance car. If you're paying $50,000 for a performance car, well, back then $50,000 was a lot of money. Today, $50,000 is getting to be a you know a fancy SUV, right? Uh, but um, in any case, um, people were paying for performance, and they had aluminum radiators. The problem with aluminum radiators until the early 90s is they had no flux, brazing flux, so that it could be repaired by any old garage. And an uh, engineer at Alcan Aluminum developed a brazing flux so you could take a flame torch and you could rebraze and repair an, alum uh, an aluminum radiator. Before that, they made them all out of copper, more expensive, heavier, but it could be repaired at the local auto, auto dealership when it sprung a leak two, three, four years later. Aluminum, when you bought that 1980 Corvette, if you had a leak in your radiator, you bought a new radiator for 600, 800, whatever the price it was, because the only people who could raise it was furnace brazing in a factory. You'd have to take the whole thing and put it through a furnace. So that's one, case, that's one example where fabricability made all the difference in the selection of the material. Once someone developed that flux, so that you, you know, the guy at the auto, uh, uh, the auto garage, could repair the aluminum, then aluminum was cheaper, uh, has all the properties you want, plus it's lightweight, um, and so aluminum took over the radiator market today. Um, another, well, another example of people looking at cost. What were muffler systems made out of in 1975? Carbon steel. What are they made out of today? 
They're stainless steel. Okay. Probably aluminum. You said aluminized. Yeah, it is aluminized. A lot of them are still made of stainless. Um, people tried to use aluminized for years, and it does work. Uh, and maybe they are. Maybe they've switched. I, I haven't looked for about 10 years. It used to irritate me no end when I was your age in 75 to go buy a car and two years later have to replace the stupid muffler. Okay, because it would just corrode out in north in the northeast where you put salt on the roads. Things piece of junk. And I knew as a metallurgist that it would cost them an extra $15 per car to save me $300 two years later. And it just, I mean, it was just stupid. Well, what happened is in 1975 or so, um, after the first energy crisis, people wanted their cars not to last five years, but they wanted them to last 10 years. Um, and that's when they started going to these red rust warranties and things like that. So there's, there's all kinds of things and the criteria that society uses changes over time. People are willing to accept cars that died from rusting and corrosion in five years and muffler systems that were gone in two years. If you, if you try to sell a car like that today, you, you'd be out of business in no time. Okay? It's what the society will accept. And it wasn't that we didn't have the ferritic stainless steels or even the aluminized steel. It's just there was this belief no one would pay for that extra quality. And I mean, well, I'm, you get me, if I go in too far on that, I'll, I'll get into a soapbox. Speaking of energy crises, I didn't, I, I mentioned actually um, last time we, I put up this uh, kind of historical perspective of, of mat different materials through the ages that Ashby had in his book. And if you look here around 1500, you see that they were still using lots of wood and skins and fibers um, at that time. Uh, and metals were actually, they were using them, but uh, cast iron and steels were not, uh, um, they were still fairly valuable. In fact, um, in the 1600s, it wasn't uncommon as a house got older, this would be a wooden house, if it had some nails in it, they would burn down the structure and sift through the ashes to recover the nails because nails were so valuable. I mean, it, it typically took about roughly one person year per ton, you know, a person year being 2,000 hours, or actually back then if they had to work 60 or 80 hours a week, it might be three or 4,000 hours per ton to produce steel. Anybody know what it takes today in a good, efficient mini mill? One hour per ton one labor hour per ton. Now that's, that is a productivity improvement that was driven by uh, technology. Not, you can't get that kind of um, productivity improvement of 2,000 fold or 3,000 fold productivity imp improvement just by working smarter, okay? You actually have to have a technological advantage. So they did do some things over 400 years. But um, what I was gonna read to you, there's a, a PBS series on the, out of the fiery furnace, which is like a eight or twelve uh, volume set, if anybody wants to watch it, I have the full set on uh, the history of metals, and uh, there's this companion volume that goes with it. Um, uh, let's see, oops, is that the right page? Oh yeah, I do. Okay, um, it's talking about England. And it's talking about um, ships. I think I may have mentioned, or actually, no, it might have been, I was watching one of my earlier tapes. Um, one of the great, well, what, what's one of society's, I mean, society has certain needs, food, shelter, clothing, health, national security. Well, national security is, in my opinion, has always been one of the big drivers for technology. It turns out Henry VIII, um, had a, uh, or his Navy had a, the HMS Victory, oh, I'm sorry, that's the, the HMS Victory was Nelson's flagship at Battle of Trafalgar, which was somewhat later than Henry VIII. But it turns out um, England was, was blessed in a sense by being an island nation and having uh, the defense of the ocean around it. And they had a, um, they, for many hundreds of years, they had a great Navy. Well, it took 2,100 2, tons of oak to build a ship because the structural material of the age was wood uh, or stone or brick, and you don't usually build ships out of stone or brick. Um, well, it turns out one of the problems they had was that uh, you also needed oak to make charcoal so you could make cast iron, 
which you needed to make the, the cannons for the ship and things like that. And so they were, they were basically cutting down the forest of England to, uh, to build these ships and to turn it into charcoal to make cast iron. And then, and those two uses, Voke says, were in conflict. And then a third industry um, added to the demands and the pressures of the forest, and that was glass making. You need charcoal to make glass. Um, such was the demand for window glass in the 16th century that scores of glassmakers from Europe crossed the channel to England and set themselves up in business in the forest where they found timber for their furnaces. The government was finally forced to act. In 1558, a law was passed forbidding the felling of trees to make coals for the burning of iron, which means making cast iron, but the weld of Kent and Sussex was exempted, perhaps because of lob lobbying by a thriving iron industry, okay? so. There's the uh, typical politics, even as we know it today. Still, the price of wood continued to climb. Um, in 1559, a writer complained that the price had risen from a penny to two shillings. I don't remember. What's the difference between a shilling and a penny? It's like factor four or something, or five or something. By reason of the iron mill, mills. Um, by 1581, the shortage of wood was... To, for ship building was so serious that a further act was passed forbidding the felling of trees within 22 miles of the Thames River, within four miles of the Great, great Forest, the Weld, and within three miles of the coastline anywhere. Obviously, you're interested in getting it to the river or to the, to the coastline to build the ships. Um, in 16, by 1615, England was facing an energy crisis. A royal proclamation in that year lamented the disappearance of the kind of wood which is not, of, not only great and large in height and bulk, but hath also the toughness and heart, as it is not subject to rive or cleave, and thereby of excellent use for shipping. Good thing that, I mean, back then, at least the, the uh, king knew that toughness was an important material property. Um, in any case, um, there was an energy crisis. And you can see one of the results of that energy crisis if you go up to Saugus. Anybody know what's in Saugus? The first ironworks in the United States. It's a National Historical Park. And because they basically said you couldn't uh, um, uh, cut the trees in England to make charcoal, they basically came to the New World to make their iron and cut their charcoal. Um, and they set up Saugus Ironworks over here, which only lasted for a few years and then went bankrupt. So, you know, history just repeats itself in terms of business and politics, and energy crises and things like that. Um, now, when people talk about new materials taking over certain industries, and this is not, well, like hopefully you can read it. I know it's not going to show up well on the video. Uh, but this is the materials usage in refrigerators in 1972 to 1988. And it turns out the refrigerator's weight is essentially identical at 190 pounds uh, over that 16-year uh, period. The amount of steel dropped from 147 out of 175% of the weight to about 70% of the weight. Um, the aluminum increased from 8 pounds to 13 pounds. The plastics, excluding the foam, which actually they did a much better job of insulating. Why? Because of the energy crisis. Okay, Refrigerators had to become more efficient during that period. But the weight of structural um, plastic went from 11 or 12 pounds to about 28 pounds or 29 pounds. Uh, and the plastic, this was actually comes out of the plastics house and say, wow, it's wonderful, plastics are being used in refrigerators now. Well, that's true, but if you really look at it, it's still 75% or 70% steel. And in fact, people, I have another slide like this. It does the exact same thing for automobiles. And people talk about uh, how steel was being dropped out of automobiles, and it's true. It went from 71% of the weight to 68% of the weight. That's, you know, big drop. Uh, and they talk about, oh, well, there's now 100 pounds of aluminum in an automobile. Well, that's pretty good compared to 10 pounds 15 years ago. That's a tenfold increase. But 100 pounds out of 2,500 pounds is still not a big fraction. Okay? So people get all excited and they quote things, but it just proves what Disraeli said. It's often attributed to Mark Twain. There's lies, damned lies, and statistics. Okay? Um, but that was Disraeli. Um, Okay, this is actually something that came out of a proprietary GE report in 1962 where a guy named Jack Westbrook um, 
hope I remember his name like you get, um, plotted structural materials based on dollars per pound. This is 1962 dollars per pound and pounds per annum of the structural material used. Well, here's stone at 10 to the 12th pounds, a lot of pounds. There's cement, there's wood, there's carbon steel, there's alloy steel, and you go down here and way down here you've got diamond, which is a structural material used as an abrasive, right? Um, and diamond at a billion dollars a pound, you know, whatever it is. What have we got? Dollars per pound, $10,000 a pound. Um, turns out diamonds come down considerably in the last 10 years because of artificial diamonds and because the Chinese have gone into the business, mainland China has gone into the business, just destroyed the, the diamond market um, for uh, some other people. These are ISO market lines here, these dash lines. Um, and you can find, you can see that you have a picture of orders of magnitude, the price, and the orders of magnitude, and pounds used. And again, you know, without trying to keep on this side of the seal. Seal is up here, up is up here, low end of the seal, you know, right there. Okay. Um, the market for seal and ours is the most much lower. One of the interesting things here is you notice that the usage, the type of the, the usage slope, which is there, versus the market size, not the market size slope, which is there, the usage slope is steeper as you go from steeper material. Uh, and that means that if you cut the price of the material, the structural material, by a factor of two, you can expect the usage to go up by a factor of four in the long run. Now, I won't go up by a factor of four in the short run. Because people have to transition over and, and redesign their products. But if the material, if you cut the price of a structural material by a factor of two, the usage will go up by a factor of four according to this plot. Uh, and actually, I've seen that uh, a number of times in, in a few few materials. It's not that you can take all materials and reduce the price by a factor, uh, a factor of uh, two, but I, actually, diamond is the usage of diamonds. I mean, you now can get honing blades for your kitchen knives that are diamond honing blades. Why? Because diamonds have come way down in price, and so you can buy these things, these diamond honing blades for 25 or 30 bucks. Um, anyway, what it means is cutting costs will actually increase your market size in the long run. Uh, so reducing the cost of the material is an important thing. Now, material scientists like to think that materials are a very important fraction of the overall cost of the product, and that turns out just not to be true. It turns out the cost of the material is actually a minor fraction of the overall product cost. If I'm talking about an automobile or an aircraft, it turns out the material, raw material cost, the steel or the aluminum or the rubber or whatever, is only about 10% of the cost of the final product. Now, if you think about it, if I'm paying $20,000 for a Ford Taurus or a uh, 15000 for a Chevy Malibu or whatever it is. Um, that means there's only about $1,500 worth of materials in that Chevy Malibu, and that's about right, order of magnitude. Um, if I'm talking about a Boeing 747, which weighs a half million pounds, and is worth, what, $150 million today? I mean, you can figure it all out for yourself, but, but uh, it's going to be something on that order um, of 10%. It turns out if you start talking functional materials or spacecraft where the value of a pound saved is tremendous, then you can start using some fairly expensive materials, but those very expensive materials have tremendous processing costs and inspection costs in spacecraft, except for Hubble te telescopes, they don't bother to inspect those. Um, uh, the price might only be 1% of, of the material cost. The largest material cost that I know of is if you're building a pipeline. Okay. It's about 30% of the cost of that pipeline is the, the pipe that you're going to put in the ground, bearing in the ground. Um, so uh, it turns out that the material cost is not a very large fraction. Now, if the value of the structural material for an automobile is $2 a pound, you can go back. This is a plot out of Ashby again, and since this is one of his other books written in 1980, and he has the dollars per ton. If you want to look at an automobile at $2 a pound, as the fabricated cost um, of the automobile. Now, 
I said $2 a pound, but the automobile weighs 3,000, 3,300 pounds, or 3,500, let's say Ford Taurus, 3,500 pounds, I don't know, something like that. That's only $7,000. Where's the other 13,000? Well, I think, uh, isn't it about three or four or 5,000 for healthcare costs for the workers for automobile? Okay, there's, you know, this overhead stuff. Um, and then there's other overheads like advertising and hopefully there's even a profit built into that 20,000, uh, at least if you own stock. Anyway, if, if the value is $2 a pound, but only 10% of the price of the material um, is gonna be the raw material, uh, what, what you can afford to pay for the raw materials, that's down to um, uh, 20 cents a pound. 20 cents a pound is $400 a ton. And at $400 a ton, what are my choices to make a car out of? Mild steel, cast iron, concrete, coal, and cement. And you can't afford to make a car out of plywood. Um, you can't really afford to make it out of plastic. And aluminum is way out of the question. Unless you're not building Ford Tauruses, you're building Audis and you're going to sell them for 45000 In which case, you can get a premium. Because what's the difference for the body in white, which is basically the, the metal structural frame? Turns out the structural frame for Ford Taurus is worth about $500 in steel, and it's worth six or $700 in aluminum. It's only a couple hundred dollars difference. The aluminum's lighter, and so you get more, more per pound in terms of building your structure. But it turns out, if you look at this, you just can't afford it. So I actually drew this line where, it, where I assume 20, I think I assumed uh, basically a thousand, roughly a thousand dollars a pound, and said these are the types of materials you can think of for something like an automobile. These are the t in here are the types of materials you can think of for aircraft. Titanium alloys are up here at the top. Nickel, stainless steels, aluminum. Good thing we can build a little amount of aluminum. Uh, polypropylene, hardwoods, and spacecraft are way up here. Boron epoxy composites. You can't afford boron epoxy composites except for spacecraft. They are not something that, Bo that uh, Boeing is going to put into a uh, commercial airliner because it's just, it doesn't make any economic sense. Now, just because it doesn't make any economic sense doesn't mean that some manager who reads the Wall Street Journal and has no knowledge of anything for that, for, because of that, um, doesn't think that they shouldn't be putting boron composites in aircraft and decides to go out and spend $10 million trying to do it, and then someone tells them they can't. But anyway, that's just the way things go. If I want to look back at properties again in the material selection, this is fracture toughness versus strength. And remember, toughness is the energy of fracture, strength is the force of fracture, and you actually need both because you need the strength to carry the load and you need the tough, toughness to resist the crack propagation. You don't think one thing shattering on you. And if you look at this, there are certain uh, these other lines that have to do with uh, fracture criteria. Okay, this is a guideline for safe design. These are two different criteria for safe design. What's and you want to be up here at the best level of this or the best level of this? Well, it means that metals are the best structural material for fracture resistance and strength for that kind of combination of those two properties. Ceramics are down here, they're biting the dust, okay? And so when the Japanese spent hundreds of millions of dollars trying to build an all ceramic engine because someone told them it was a great thing, someone forgot to tell them that you need a structural material to build an engine, okay? And they wasted probably half a billion dollars, or yeah, half a billion dollars trying to do that, if not more. Um, and you can see where other materials lie on here. Plastics are in here, uh, woods and other plastics, well, foams down here, plastics in here. And at, if you want lightweight, but you don't need tremendous toughness, actually, they compete with steels pretty well. Ceramics are garbage from the point of view of a structural material, unless you're trying to build a fireplace or something like that without very... Um, if you want to look at fracture toughness versus density, well, fracture toughness versus density, some of these composites are among the best. Um, but if you get the cost in here, you're going to find those things drop way down. Again, metals have these kind of interesting uh, properties. You can, you can do some sort of figure of merit 
to look at selection of a material for a given application. If you just look at strength and density, steel has a figure of merit of 6.7, aluminum has a figure of merit of 7.4. Aluminum is slightly better in terms of strength to density. Simple composites are basically on a par with steel. Plastics are significantly worse. And wood, well, you know, wood is uh, uh, less than all of, all of those except plastics. And actually, in some cases, less than, less than plastics. However, wood has one advantage, that it's easy to fabricate. And so that's why if you're going to build some furniture for your home, it's easier to do it out of wood than it is to do it out of steel, unless you happen to be a metal worker with a full metal working shop. Yeah? Are you familiar with the Corvette, how they use the balsa wood sandwich between the plastic for the floor, floor pans? Yeah, uh, well, I didn't know it was balsa wood. I actually have a piece. I almost bought it today of a uh, Nippon, I think it's Nippon steel, maybe it's uh, Nippon Kokon where they put plastic between two sheets for the oil pan, not necessarily the floor pan. I, I suspect balsa wood between the floor pan is for lightweight, okay, because they, they're using balsa wood for the, the foam, but it also keeps the noise down, right? In fact, if, if I remember, <coughs> I'll remember if I write a note. Um, it's for sound, for oil pans, it's for sound dampening. And essentially, I'll bring it in. You, you go, you you tap it with your finger, and it goes thump. Okay. Um, anyway, what was your question about it? Oh, or just why did they use it? Oh, I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. Well, actually, if you want to see, they they do it. I'm sure for light weight. Weight. Um, here's balsa right here. It has pretty good strength. Very lightweight. I mean. The only thing I'm going to get better is cork, and cork is too expensive. Why? Because they have to make it out of wine bottle corks, right? There's a shortage of cork for wine bottles. Although I just read something, they've come up with a plastic that's going to replace them, supposedly. But you can use foams, but they don't have the strength. Balsa wood, for its weight, is one of the best. And so, hey, on a Corvette, that's GM's premium vehicle. Uh, that's their flagship in terms of putting in technology. They're going to go with a lightweight structural material, balsa. You look on this plot, it tells you to use it. They need thickness for stiffness, bending resistance, but they need steel for corrosion resistance, dent resistance, everything else, because balsa is not very good in that. So they put two thin layers of sheet. I didn't know that's what they were using. I don't buy Corvettes, although I did buy a new car recently. My daughter was with me, and she liked to sit in the Corvette in the showroom. Um, I guess she, she, would, she says she'd like to have a Corvette. I think it's a very interesting car, probably useful driving three days a year um, for a Corvette convertible, anyway, in New England. Um, anyway, if you look at cost per um, per pound, steel is twenty cents, aluminum is a buck twenty. Simple composites, simple composites, two to ten dollars a pound. Now, if I use my rule of thumb, thumb rule of thumb, I'm multiplying these by ten to get the fabricated cost. Now, part of that fabricated cost is for every pound of steel I buy in the coil to make the automobile body, I'm going to scrap 50% of it. And I'm lucky to get three or four cents a pound. Actually, I get about four cents a pound back on the scrap. So I'll get 10% of this 20 cents back on the uh, scrap, the value of the scrap, but I have to buy twice as many pounds as I'm going to sell because of the scrap value. Or the, uh, I got to stamp out a complex shape out of a rectangular sheet. But that's also true of aluminum and stuff. Simple composites. Simple composites be things like fiberglass. Um, if we're going to some aerospace graphite epoxy or boron epoxy, as you know, these numbers can get pushed up to $1,000 a pound. And if you add the extra factor of 10, you get $10,000 a pound, which is what the space shuttle uh, or the X-33 uh, hydrogen tank that I brought in the other day. Plastics. The cheapest plastics are about 60 cents a pound. You want really good structural plastics, you're going to be paying a buck a pound or more. And wood is more expensive than, than, uh, than steel, but less expensive than a lot of other things. OK, questions on any of that? Um, let me just talk a little bit about improvements in the steel industry, because I realize that by spending too much time on the steel industry, but the steel industry is much maligned, some of it just, justified, but uh, much maligned. 
uh, as a dying industry. Um, and the easiest way for me to look at it is um, this steel industry shipments in the United States was roughly constant at 75 million tons. Forget this drop here in the recession of 82. That's a straight line across there, that, that blue line, so we just tie it together. But over the decade, about 75 million tons. Now, we also import about 25 million tons. It turns out for the last 30 to 35 years, the United States has used about 100 million tons of steel a year. There actually has been a growth in the need for steel, but the improvements in the steel itself, going to higher strength steels, has essentially kept the usage in terms of tons relatively constant. Um, so we might be making lighter weight steel structures, but we're using the same amount. Well, during that period, the employment dropped from half a million people in the steel industry to 250,000. And if you go today, you'll find that 1990, uh, we're still using 100 million tons of steel, uh, or not to 1990, but 2000, from 1990 to 2000, that next decade, but the employment has gone down by another factor of two. Well, okay, so the consumption is constant, the employment's gone down by a factor of two. All you economists out there, this is for your PhD in economics, what does that mean about productivity in the industry? Consumption's constant, employment's gone down by a factor of two. What does that mean about productivity? It went up by a factor of two. Okay, the equation is you take consumption and or the uh, productivity times the number of workers uh, will give you the consumption. If the cons consumption is constant, one goes down by a factor two, the other one has to go up. And lo and behold, the productivity, pounds per person hour, went up from 150 to 300. Okay, that's how you get a PhD in economics, okay. Um, so the steel industry in 10 years had a factor of two improvement. What is that as a percentage? improvement per year. Come on, some of you are business folks. What's the rule of 72? 7%, 7.2% 7 .2 a year. Okay, the rule of 72, right? You take 72 and divide by the uh, uh, the number of years and that gives you the doubling, or the, you divide by the percentage increase and that gives you your doubling time. Pardon me? Yeah, like the, yeah, annual the annual rate. So if I had 8% productivity growth, it would take nine years to double. Uh, or if I put my money in the bank at 5%, it's going to take 14 years, 14.4 years to double. Well, 7.2% or 7% productivity increase in an industry, a manufacturing industry, over a decade? That's pretty incredible, isn't it? There's only one industry that outstrips the steel industry and in improve productivity over that period. Anybody know what it is? An even more maligned industry the mining industry. And why have these industries changed so dramatically? The threat of extinction clarifies the mind. Okay? You were willing to take risk. The steel industry would not take risk in 1960, which were in the American steel industry, which is one of the reasons they got themselves in trouble. But when you know, when people know that they could be losing their job tomorrow if they don't do things more efficiently today, they will start thinking of taking chances that they will otherwise wouldn't wouldn't take. There's a story of Chaparral Steel, which is a mini mill, and the mini mills were basically, well, let me explain what the mini mills are, because it's kind of an important lesson for all materials. Um, well, actually, I've actually never presented this in class, but I might as well. Um, I was, there's, there's an important paper here um, that I've never bothered to write but I've tried to convince some students to take the time. If you look at time and years, and you look at the size of an industry, it will follow what we call a sigmoid type of behavior where you grow and you basically level out, okay? So if you want, if we want to talk about steel industry, here's 1856 with Henry Bessemer, and here's Andrew Carnegie, the entrepreneurs, and here's the growth phase uh, through the world wars, and basically we get up here to 1960 or something and we're still using 100 million tons of steel and it just hasn't grown. We're, we've been flat for 40 years in the usage of steel. Now that's usage, or this is production. 
within, and you could do the same type of thing with aluminum. If aluminum, it would be 18, 1884 with uh, Charles Martin Hall and the Hall for Row process for making aluminum. We'll talk about that later. Um, but there's also a recycling curve, and a recycling curve is going to follow a similar type of, whoops, a similar type of sigmoid behavior, and it will probably it's going to level out at some percentage. For steel, it's about 70 percent, and we have leveled out at about 70 percent recycling. And we probably, if this was 1960 in steel, this was probably somewhere like 1980. I don't know exactly where we leveled out, and we've been recycling 70 percent of the steel we used ever since. So, but the interesting thing about this. If I want to look at another industry like aluminum, I just keep the same graph. I just erase the uh, numbers, and I aluminum the recyclability may be somewhere else. But it turns out aluminum has kind of leveled out, but the recycling of aluminum is probably somewhere in here. And you can look at the ratio of the slope of this to the slope of this, and you can figure out where in this generic set of curves, these two curves, you are in that industry. So all you have to do, you know the slope, because you can compare over the last two or three years how the recycling of a material like aluminum is. You'll find aluminum is up here reaching the peak of its recyclability. However, if I want to look at some other material, I could draw these same types of curves, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to see, I'm not gonna, I don't, in the real world, I don't know what happens in the future. I just look at the slopes today, and I can figure out where I am and where that industry is going to go. Okay, so there's your key. Use that information. Go out and get rich. Okay, um, kind of a broad way to look at it, but um, I'm not going to go through the chaparral steel things. But basically, they, well, actually, I will. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of examples just to show you the type of processing that's been done. Uh, it turns out that chaparral steel, um, it's a company owned. Or, uh, it's not company. It is company owned, but it's employee. Uh, uh, profit sharing plan and every week on the bulletin boards they publish their profit figures for the week before and so every employee tracks that because that is money in their pocket and they treat the business like it's money in their pocket if they can save a hundred dollars by reusing something or getting something cheaper they feel like it's money in their po pocket and so they have this attitude of trying to save money and whereas you know you take the government or a lot of big companies, if you don't use your budget this year, you're going to get cut next year, so you spend no matter what you've got, right? Anyway, well, but anyway, at Chaparral, they have a kind of a different culture. Well, these guys, the people on the production floor would spend one week a year going out with the salespeople at the customers, and they found out for um, seal reinforcing bar, um, seal reinforcing bar comes in, is sized in eighths of an inch of diameter. And the smallest is number three, which is three eighths inch diameter. And it goes up to like number 14, which is one and a half inch diameter steel reinforcing bar. This is stuff that goes in concrete, you know, to strengthen it. Garbage variety steel. Absolutely the lowest quality of steel you can imagine. But that's where the mini mills started because they were just melting old automobiles and they couldn't produce, originally they couldn't produce the higher quality products. So they were producing the garbage variety steel. Well, these guys learned there was a 15% price premium for number three reinforcing bar as opposed to the larger diameter stuff. And the reason was when you have a thin strip going through there, you can't put as many tons through the mill. It's a very capital intensive industry. The mill is very expensive. You can't put as many tons through there. You're limited to about 60 miles an hour of the hot strip going through the mill. You get above 60 miles an hour and you start getting instabilities and the stuff kinks and coils and stuff. But that's pretty fast. Well, these guys tried. They said, oh, we, we want that 15% premium. We're going to be the supplier of number three rebar because we want that extra 15% in our pockets. And they went back and they tried to speed up the mill and they couldn't do it. They tried for probably a year or more. And then finally said, someone says, we shouldn't be trying to speed up the mill. We should be slowing it down. And so what they did is they took one bar coming in and they split it into two going out. And then further down, they took the two coming from further uh, back there in the mill and they split it again into four. 
So they cut the speed down to 30 miles an hour, but they got four strands coming out, so they doubled their productivity by thinking differently. And that's sort of the way you have to learn to think. You should not, when the, well, let me back up. If you really have respect for the knowledge of other people, you will have to accept that there are other people out there that are just as bright as you are. And some of them are willing to work just as hard. And so if you actually start with that type of an assumption, you should not be trying to do what everyone else is trying to do. In fact, you should usually try to go in the opposite direction. I learned this in second grade at an Easter egg hunt. Okay? At the Easter egg hunt, it's just, like, it's just like watching a second grade soccer game. Everybody goes to where the ball is, right? All the kids run to the soccer ball, right? And then someone kicks it out of the pack and everyone goes running over there, right? Well, as, as Wayne Gretzky said, he, he, tra he skates to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck is. Everybody knows who Wayne Gretzky is, uh, world's greatest hockey player. Um, retired now, but anyway. Um, well, at the Easter egg hunt, some kid says, oh, I found an Easter egg. So we all go running over there. Well, I was kind of late getting there, and I, was, I realized I was looking at the backs of all these other kids, and, and there were another 20 eyes looking for Easter eggs in this little area. And I thought, this is silly. I'm not going to find an Easter egg with all these other eyes looking. So I decided to go to the other end of the yard and look by myself where no one else was. And that's how you find the Easter eggs. You look where other people are not looking. So when the, the, in, at Chaparral Steel, when they tried to copy everyone else by going faster, they weren't any smarter than anybody else. They weren't going to win the prize by trying to do what a lot of other smart, hardworking people were going to do. Someone said, let's go the opposite direction. And if I say, OK, I'm going to go the opposite direction, what can I do to improve things if I go the opposite direction? Um, I actually think that's a probably the most important lesson you'll get out of here, but it won't be on my bullets tomorrow. Um, now, another thing they did at Chaparral and other places is ordinarily you continuously cast steel, um, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about that uh, next week. But you basically cast these long. Well, you, you cast it. You have to cast it vertically because gra we, we live with gravity. But the, while it's hot, you actually bend it and it comes out um, as a long, continuous stream of steel. And then you cut that off in separate lengths, and you roll that down. Well, it usually would come out as big rectangular slabs if you're going to make I-beams. Well, at Chaparral, this was probably about early 90s, they said, well, why cast it rectangular? We, if we're going to roll it into I-beams anyway, let's cast it as a dog bone and get part of the first few passes of rolling done. And over the years, they improved it such that this is probably about 1995 or 96. This was the cast shape. It's almost an I-beam already. And it turns out when they did that, instead of having this great big rectangular piece, instead of like 28 passes through the rolling mill, they were down to like 9 or 10. So the productivity at the rolling mill went up by a factor of 3. The productivity in the casting shop might have even gone down by a factor of 2. But the rolling mill productivity went up by a factor of three. And guess what? Because they had a thinner section they were casting, you see how it's only red in a few spots here? It cooled more quickly. It gave a finer grained structure, which for steel and most metals is finer grained, is you know uh, much better toughness and strength. They were able to meet both the 36 KSI strength grade and the premium 50 KSI strength grade by the same composition steel. And they got rid of, actually, they didn't get rid of their SKUs. They got rid of, they produced the same steel for the same two SKUs. They had an SKU for 36 KSI and 50 KSI. You want a 36 KSI steel from Chaparral? They'd ship you this stuff. You want a 50 KSI? They'd ship you the same stuff. They'd just charge you a premium for it because you ordered 50, because that was the, the standard in the industry. So all of a sudden, they could make the higher quality stuff for the same price as the lower, the lower quality stuff and sell the higher quality stuff for the premium price. What? 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 Someone else did that? Uh, microprocessors. Microprocessors. OK, tell me the story on microprocessors. Uh, so we'll, you'll make the highest speed frequency, and then customers want a lower speed, you just, just down bit it. Down bit it, OK.
Yeah, actually, uh, actually, someone said, uh, why do uh, Hewlett-Packard laser printers only run at eight pages or 12 pages a minute? Because they program them to run that slow, okay? So it's, it's probably the same thing as, as, uh, as you're saying for microprocessors. Uh, you're speaking out of from what, Intel? From Intel's perspective? Yeah, I've always, well, I was, well never mind. Um, Yeah, so it's branding to a certain extent, uh, and people don't know. The problem is, uh, if they sell it, the, the processor, actually, the software, they do change the clock speed, right? Yeah. So, well, so if you knew how to actually go in there and adjust the clock speed, you could buy the cheaper computer and, and get the uh, a higher performance, right? Yeah, so there's actually a big market for that. Is there? They don't do overclocking. Oh, okay. The higher and lower speed lines. Yeah. Okay, well, um, didn't don't usually get quite as far as I wanted to, but tomorrow we'll talk about um, um, ratio analysis diagrams, and then actually get into different types of materials other than steel. There are other materials, but proportionally, I'm spending the proper amount of time on steel since it's 90% of the market, right? Okay.